Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is part two for the recorded lecture for the topic intention to create legal relations. Uh, in part one, we have discussed up to um, the case of, let's have a look, what was the case? Okay, we discussed about the case of good good, okay, uh, in relation to domestic relations. So basically, the rule is that there's no intention between them, okay, unless, uh, but uh, it depends on the facts, okay, some, because uh, if the parties can prove it, so the presumption is rebuttable. Now we want to know what is the position of law under Contracts Act 1950. Do we have any specific provisions um, on the topic okay, in relation to intention to create legal relations? Actually, our Contracts Act, Malaysian Contracts Act, Malaysian Contracts Act, it is silent okay, on the issue, on the question, okay, whether there's a need to prove intention to create legal relationship or not. But from the decided cases, from case law, uh, it, it shows that uh, there is, it shows that such an intention is a vital requirement okay, for a valid contract. In other words, the parties mu must have the intention uh, to enter into such a relationship. So even though there's no specific provisions, but a case law, it shows that Yes, this is also another requirement for a valid and enforceable contract. Let's have a look at the case law. Now it, uh, it's between family members. This is local case reported in MLG. Um, the case name is Chu Tiong Hin and Chu Hock Sui. This is actually a case from Singapore reported in 1959. It uh, revolved around a dispute between plaintiff and plaintiff was respondents later because the case was brought up to the appeal. Uh, and who was the plaintiff or respondents here? Plaintiff uh, was the, uh, the adoptive father, not biological father, adoptive father. And who were the defenders? Defenders or uh, appellants here, yeah? uh, they were the adopted sons. Okay, let's have a look at the facts here. I have prepared the summary of the facts in the box. I don't know where to fit the, the, the okay. All right, so the first box there. So plaintiff, um, the father, okay, adoptive father, and um, his first wife, uh, they went in. Uh, they went to live in a farm in Singapore, and they had two daughters, their own daughters, and they also have adopted five sons. Not one, two, three, but five. Okay, uh, actually, to work uh, with uh, to I mean to work together in the farm. So they work in the farm and various other family businesses. And later, the wife died. The first wife died, and responded remarried. And after the remarriage, actually here, okay, um, there were family quarrels, and responded. Uh, the adopted sons okay, left the family home and later the sons claimed possession of the farm and other property because they have been working together. So they said they were entitled uh, over the possession of the farm as well as property. And then um, the defendants or appellants also alleged that there was a contract that is a document between plaintiff and defendant in which okay, according to the contract, so-called contract, defendant agreed to be adopted okay, about ad adoption and also to work on the farm. And because they have been uh, assisting, helping to acquire wealth, so by right, they were entitled equally with the plaintiff, uh, with the parent, okay, with the father, to the possession of the farm and other properties. Properties here refers to two motto uh, lorries. What happened next? Okay. But the Court of Appeal of Singapore held that agreement between plaintiff and defendant was not binding because it's between father, okay, parent, and also the, the sons, okay, five adopted, adopted sons here. And then the court said there was no legal intention for such, an, for such a family arrangement to be binding. They don't, they don't anticipate okay, when they enter into such a promise or agreement here, they will be suing each other later in the court. Right? Uh, so this, this case also shows that it's quite hard to rebut the presumption of there is no intention between uh, no intention to create legal relation between family members. And in Malaysia, we also have a federal court decision in the Sarawak case. The case name is Pyong Kon and Chon Chaifa, reported in 1970. So the court actually held that agreement between family members not to be not binding. Again, it lacks of a necessary intention to create legal relations. So it is similar to the case of uh, Chong, Chu Tiong Hin and Chu Hoxwee. So similar judgment. We have another case, which is quite recent, not so recent, but quite recent, uh, 2014. The case name is Un Hun Wah and Noble Global Senior Brahat and others. So here is between uh, father and son, and it involves family business, family company. 
and then actually the the um, the, the father promised to give 50 shares 50 shares uh, in the two companies um so father is the defendant and then later um i mean the, there was a change of the promise okay, the, i mean the board what member of the company pro, um uh, decided okay, not to give the 50 percent so the son was not happy so that's why um the, the son challenged okay, the promise by the father here uh, i mean the, the the son asked for specific performance so the court held that the promise okay, by the father here uh, was not in an agreement there's no legal agreement actually. there's nothing uh in writing okay and again eh, the court said it could not constitute an intention to create legal relations okay, which was impossible by court order so it uh actually the court just reiterate the rule which was which was held in the earlier cases that we have discussed okay and also the court mentioned specifically okay whatever promise okay, generally whatever promise by the father towards uh children to a son to a daughter here okay in the court said here no better than any other parental promise okay, made to extract good behavior from one's offspring. So to encourage the son okay, to be good, um, I mean to do, to, to work hard, okay, to study hard, to do whatever good okay, for their family, okay, for the sake of their family. So there's no, nothing uh, legal. Okay? I mean, they, here, they don't anticipate it to be uh, sued by the son later for if the, uh, the parent breached the promise. So that's what the court said. This is the ratio. That's it and down. Okay, another um another perspective. Okay, when we talk about uh, intention in domestic relations here, okay, what if okay, whatever promises here, okay, what if it give or it bears serious consequences? It leads to serious consequences. Can we still uh, can we still um say that there's no intention between them? Okay, so basically, if the party can prove that actually whatever promise here it has serious consequences on them. This is uh, one of the ways okay, to rebut the presumption. And this is what happened in the case of Parker and Clark. This is common law, 1960. What happened was that, okay, uh, Mrs. Parker was the niece of Mrs. Clark. So it's between auntie and um, uh, uh, auntie and nephew. Okay? And then, sorry, uncle, sorry. Uncle and niece, so uncle and niece here. So not really a parent, okay, but then uh, the uh, niece, okay, niece, nephew, uncle, auntie. So yeah, Mr. Clark changed his will, okay, leaving house to the Parkers, to the uh, niece and nephew, basically, or to the niece and the husband. And later, okay, uh, I think something which is common in family. So the couples fell out, okay, they quarrel, and now the Parkers were asked to leave, okay, leave, okay, move from my house, okay. Initially, they asked them to uh, to to uh, to stay together. Okay. Um. All right. Sorry. I think we we are the 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 sequence of the story. Okay. First, okay. Uh, Miss Parker was the niece. That's uh, I mean, who, who are they? I mean, what's the relation? And then they have agreement actually. Okay? Agreement was made that the Parkers would sell their house and live with the Clark. I mean that here. Okay. Please come in. Live. Uh, come and stay with us. So because um the niece already have a house, so they sold off their house and come and live with their uh, auntie or uncle here, all right? And then the promise is that they will share the bills and the class will then leave the house to the parkers. Okay, we'll share the bills and later I will give you the house. So that's the uh, promise. Uh, and then um, Mrs. Clark also wrote to the parkers, giving them the details of expenses and confirming the agreement. So the exit agreement actually between them. Okay, So this is the details of the bill and this is our promise that we are going to give you the house. So because of that, okay, on the basis of the um, promises here, Parker's sold, okay, yeah, sold their house and moved in okay, into the uh, um, uncle okay, or auntie's house here. Uncle, uh, uncle. And Mr. Clark later, okay, initially they promised to give the house, but later Mr. Clark, the uncle, changed his will, leaving the house, sorry, uh, I mean, late, uh, to, to prove that, yes, they are serious about it, Mr. Clark changed his will, leaving the house to the parker. So yes, you are going to leave the house to you after uh, our death, okay, after we die. But later, okay, the moment they live together, okay, after some time, the couples fell out. Okay, and now the parkers were asked to leave. Okay, move out. Okay, now we are, I mean, they are not really on good terms okay, after some time. Now, okay, the, the niece, okay, the, uh, the niece and the, the husband, they claim damages for breach of contract. Now, the issue before the court, okay, was their intention to create legal relations between uh, this family uh, arrangement here? So the court held that, okay, because there were, there were letters exist okay, to prove the existence of the contract. 
So the exchange of letters showed that the two couples okay, were serious. I mean, couples, uh, uncle and uh, the wife, and also the niece and the husband. So were serious, okay, and the agreement was intended to be legally binding. First, okay, we can see from the facts just now, the Parkers had sold their own home. Very serious. Okay? And then Mr. Clark really was serious about, um, uh, about the, the promise. Okay? Mr. Clark actually changed his will. So based on these two reasoning, these, these two factors, the Parkers actually, the niece okay, and the husband, were entitled to damages. They were breach of promise here. Okay? We have another case, Tanner and Tanner. Here, yeah, not really between spouses, but also between husband and wife, and consider as one household. A man promised a woman, I mean, they, they live together, uh, the house okay, that uh, they, uh, they, hit, they, had, they, they had lived together in that house, okay, but they, they don't register their marriage whatsoever, no registration of marriage. Okay, and then uh, the man promised that, okay, I'll make available, uh, I mean, our house is meant for our children. So they have children okay, out of their relationship. But later, there's a change of mind whatsoever. So now, uh, the woman um, is claiming for the promise. Okay? Yeah. I mean, want to, uh, want to enforce the promise. So the court held that the promise by the man had contractual force. Okay? Because why? In reliance on it, the woman had moved out of her rent control flat. And this is something which is serious. Okay? A very big decision. I mean, they were serious about it. That's why the woman decided to move out of her rent control flat. Okay, uh, now let's go. Just now we, we focus on spouses, okay, and we focus on the families, okay, uh, uncle, auntie, and also husband, wife. Now we go to parent and child, okay. Uh, what's the rule? I mean, what's the presumption? Yes, presumption is that there's no, it's not binding. There's no intention between them, okay. Let's say if a father promised to give his car, okay, to the son, and the son promised to something in return to the father. For example, okay, I'll give you a uh, chocolate, all right. So it looks like a normal agreement, okay, because there's exchange of consideration, there's offer acceptance. And then uh, but what if the father ha had a change of mind later? Okay, oh, I'm not giving you my car. Actually, I just want you to study hard so that I just promise to give you a car, but later I won't be I won't be giving you the car. So um can the son actually uh, sue the father based on the promise? Generally, no. Okay, because why? They are just parent and child. They are related. And uh, they are, and when the father made the promise, they were on friendly terms. So they were not really, they were serious, but then they don't anticipate okay, that they are suing each other later if there is any breach of promise. And this is the case okay, uh, between mother and daughter. Okay, uh, Jones and Pedro 1969. In 1962, Miss, Mrs. Mrs. Jones offered, this is the mother, okay, offered a monthly allowance to her daughter uh, because she asked the daughter to give up her job in America, US, and she asked the daughter to come to England and she asked the daughter to become a barrister, lawyer. Okay? And because of accommodation problem, Mrs. Jones bought a house okay, in London and then the, the daughter leave and then also the daughter received rent from other tenants. But later they quarrel, okay? In 1967, here five years later, they fell out and Mrs. Jones claimed the house even though the, the daughter had not even passed half of her exams okay, to become a lawyer. I mean, um, have yet to graduate from the study. And then the daughter uh, challenged, okay, the, I mean, wanted to enforce the promise made by the mother. The court held that the agreements were a family arrangement. It's just a normal family arrangement and there's no intention between them. Okay? To be legally bound, I mean to be legally bound by the promise. So and the court held that the mother was not liable on the maintenance and agreement. Okay, and uh, the mother also could claim back the house. So whatever promises by the mother towards the child, and they were on good terms. Okay, so it's not meant to be legally binding. I mean, the mother or the parent can have a change of mind and no need to really fulfill the promises. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, in some other situation, there could be some parties, okay, they are, they are, I mean, they were sharing a household, but that's, I mean, not really related, not really families, but they just live together, okay. For example, where the parties, the agreement share a household, but are not related, no, no family ties, okay, no blood relations, okay. So what is the court decision in that situation? The court will examine all the circumstances. This is what happened in the case of Simkins, Simkins and Pace, and I think. 55. What happened between them? Uh, there are two, there, there were three people, I mean three people living together. 
defendant, okay, granddaughter, I mean the granddaughter of defendant and also plaintiff. So plaintiff, no blood relation, okay, not totally, I mean, no connection. So plaintiff was a paying lodger. So they shared a house, okay, three of them shared a house and three of them, they con contributed one third of the stake in. So they enter, I mean, they, they have been entering competition, but they use only one, one's name, uh, defendant, uh, defendant's name, okay, the grandmother. And one lucky week, okay, they uh, they won a prize. Okay, the amount is 750, 750 pounds. Uh, but uh, defendant refused to share okay, because the 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 uh, I mean the, the name of the defendant was being used. Okay, now plaintiff said, Yeah, I, I am entitled, I'm entitled to one third. I contributed one third. So I want I want my portion. Okay. So the court held that even though they were living, living together as one household. Okay, but because plaintiff was totally outsider, okay, presence of, of outsider rebutted the presumption that it was a family agreement. Okay, it's not really totally family arrangement here. And then another factor, another reason is that the court said that whatever arrangement, agreement between them, it involved money. It was joint enterprise and they contributed cash. Okay, and they expect to get some profit okay, when, they win, when they want it. And they really want it. So... By right, okay, uh, the price has to be uh, has to be divided accordingly, according to one third each, basically. So there was intention to create legal relation, even though they were staying together as one household. In the, but compare this with uh, with the case of Hardy not and Hardy not. Okay, similar case but with, with, with different results. Because here, court of appeal held that. Uh, it's between a wife and husband. Uh, that's the reason why, actually, even though they were also entering into competition. So here, a wife who had assisted her husband in making a correct forecast uh, in a football pool. So the wife was not entitled to share the winning. Because I think because of the relation of husband and wife here. So again, the court just applied the rule that there's no, um, there's no intention to create legal relations between husband End of, and they were uh, in on good terms. Okay, when they entered, uh, I mean, when they make such a when they enter into the agreement, okay, about joining or entering into the competition. Okay, now let's move to another categories of people also within domestic um, relations. Okay, friends. Okay, can can uh, a friend sue each other for whatever promises by of uh, by friends between friends here. Yeah. So uh, it depends actually. Okay, it depends on the factual circumstances. So presumption against contractual intention has been applied uh, by the courts to a variety of arrangement. So it includes arrangement for sharing petrol costs, okay, where a person is given a leave to work. Then here is it something which is social in nature, or does it carry any um, commercial uh, consequence, okay, or commercial elements? So this is the case, Coward and Motor Insurance Bureau, 1963, Common Law. What happened was that uh, Mr. Coward, I mean, they are friends, okay, both of them friends. Mr. Coward was taken to work on the pillion of Mr. Coles. So they are good friends with the Coles motorcycle. And in return for which service, he paid a weekly sum. So that's money payment, weekly basis. okay. And then one day, accident occurred okay, due to Mr. Coles' negligence. And both friends here were killed. Now, uh, the action was brought by the widow. okay. And one of the issues which is relevant for our discussion is that whether Mr. Coward here was a person carried for hire or reward, okay? Does it give does it give rise to any some business arrangement here? Okay, the court held that Mr. Coward in this case they're just friends. Okay, there's nothing uh there's nothing commercial in their relations okay? in their arrangement here. So Mr. Coward was not a person carried for hire or reward. Okay, it doesn't amount to something which is which has elements of uh um, generating profit whatsoever. Okay, but later in this case, the court make it clear. Okay, similar argument was being raised. So this is decision by House of Lord. The case name is Albert and Motor Insurance Bureau, 1972. So in this case, in order to make the things clearer, the House of Lord formulated the test. Okay, what's the test here? Whether there is a systematic caring okay, of passengers, which went beyond the bounds of mere social kindness. That is business arrangement. Mean here. Is it a mere social kindness between them? Or is it something which is business in nature, business element? Is it business, business arrangement? It depends okay, on the, uh, on the uh, facts. Okay? But if you were to apply this test to the earlier case, okay, to this uh, Coward and Motor Insurance Bureau, I think the answer will be in negative. There's no such thing. They're just friends. Okay? 
I mean, uh, the payment of the um, petrol, sorry, the payment of the uh, petrol, okay, they, they just pay a certain amount here, all right, of, out of social kindness, it is between friends, okay, nothing business in nature. Okay, we stop here, uh, we are going to continue in part three of the lecture.